Hello, everyone. We're going to wait just a few minutes to see if folks join us a few minutes late. I know it's evening time in some parts of the world. Um, but if you're here, thanks for being here and we'll get started soon. Um, all right, well, we can go ahead and get started. We've got a lot to cover and I want to make sure we can get to it all and then also have a minute to answer some Q&A throughout. Um, so my understanding of the Attendify platform is that you all won't be able to speak directly to us, but um, at any point, if you have questions or comments, feel free to use the chat. Um, when both of us are quietly not speaking while the other one is, um, we can respond or call out to say, hey, wait a minute, um, there's a question that feels relevant. So um, please don't hesitate to do that. And thank you for taking the time to join us. Uh, my name is Kristen Medlin. I'm the Director of Research at Collaboratory, and I'm also a co-founder of Collaboratory along with Drs. Emily Yonke and Barbara Holland from UNC Greensboro. And today's presentation um, is really focused on the intersection of community engagement, higher education community engagement, and the sustainable development goals. Um, these are two areas that have typically been siloed in a university. And um, I've had the pleasure of working with my colleague, Jessica Gibbons from Arizona State University. Um, and we really enjoyed working together and bringing those two areas together. Uh, so I'll let Jessica introduce herself in a little bit. Um, but before we do that, just wanted to give a little introduction for folks who were unfamiliar with higher ed community engagement. And Jess, if you'll advance two slides for me. There's me. Um, next one. There we go. Um, so there, the field of higher education community engagement is really focused on two foundational principles. And so um, we talk about the Carnegie definition of community engagement, which is um, based in the principles of mutual benefit and reciprocity. So the exchange of knowledge is reciprocity. And then this idea that there's a win-win in the relationship is mutual benefit. Um, that has been a framework that has existed for probably 40 years or so. I would say the early 90s is when that started. So I guess that's 30 years. I can't count. I'm not a mathematician. Um, and so some of the work we started exploring at UNC Greensboro started to talk about public service work alongside community engagement work and really wanting to recognize the full spectrum of activities. So knowing that community engagement, um, which we often see in community-based participatory research or service learning um, is engagement of, of a certain bar, right? But that a, a number of the public service activities that our institutions participate in are just as valuable. Um, we used to say if you took the university up out of um, Greensboro, where we live, you would be missing a dearth of cultural resources, athletic resources, camps, clinics, um, just a number of things that that university provides. Um, and so for us, um, collaboratory was a way for us to try to understand all of that information. We knew that UNCG was a very large university. The right hand never knew what the left one was doing. And so um, we came up with collaboratory. And it was really meant to help us answer the question, who are we as a community engaged university? And so we believe that if we could collect all of the data, centralize it, and then make it available and transparent and aggregable, um, that we could really tell a, a unified narrative about who we were um, as a member of our communities. And so fast forward uh, 10 years um, into the future, and now I work in the corporate sector, and we work with a community of practice of about 42 um, universities across the country. And we're working with them to help them understand the landscape of their engagement. So the who, the what, the where, the when and the why of activities that they conduct in and with their communities. Um, so since 2016, we've had about 2,541 published activities, um, which is huge. And there's probably at least double that number that are um, still pending in a draft format that we're working with folks to get through. Um, and then that number probably encompasses over 7,000 community partner relationships, 2,500 engaged courses and sections, and over 1,000 research connections. And so one of the things that makes Collaboratory different than other systems that track things um, is that we treat the activity as the unit of analysis. And I think this is a little bit different, and it's important for the, um, the research that we're going to share with you today because before um, I worked with something like Collaboratory, we worked in systems that prioritized the course, the program, or the community partner as the measurement unit. 
And what we saw happening was that our faculty were getting burned out. Um, it was kind of death by a thousand cuts with reporting fatigue. And so different stakeholders across campus would be coming to them every couple weeks asking for a similar piece of data. Um, and it may not have been similar, but to that faculty member, it was perceived as similar. It was one week, it was, I need to understand your service learning um, designation. The next week, it was, I need to understand your service hours. The next week, it was, I need to understand where you're integrating this into your research. And so our um, theory is that if we could collect all of this simultaneously, that not only would we be able to tell a better story about our engagement, we'd actually be um, able to help faculty not be so frustrated with people who are trying to help them do this work on campuses. And so the database that we have, um, it's a graph database. It supports a highly relational data structure and we're able to tell the story of who is working with who. And so in developer land, um, that little picture you see up in the right hand corner, um, we talk about nodes and edges. And what you need to know is that the, the relationships or the edges, the lines, are just as important as the data that we have about the entities themselves. Um, and so the, the neat thing is that we're able to use our data to start to ask some bigger questions on community engagement. I think before we had data like Collaboratory provides, um, we were doing very small case studies that were focused on one or two um, qualitative stories of engagement that were very contextualized in a particular um, setting or characteristic. And now with 2,500 data points, we're able to talk a little bit more generally about trends that we're seeing across the country. Um, and so I'm excited Jess is gonna share some of that in a little bit. Um, before she does that, I do wanna share just a few things about our data. Um, every data set has its limitations, nothing is perfect. And ours in particular, um, just keep in mind that the data that we capture is self-reported by our faculty and staff. Um, I think it also varies depending on who is reporting, um, I'm sorry, who is leading the collaboratory initiative on their campus. They all take different rollout strategies. Some campuses say, you know what, I'm gonna have more success asking for data from our co-curricular units. Others say, I really wanna dig into the classes that we already know are designated as service learning. Um, so it really just varies. And I think because of that, um, we're working towards a truly representative sample in our database. Um, and we hope to get there closer to this summer but until then, um, there are some caveats to the kinds of data that we see in here that result from how institutions are reporting data. Um, all right, so why are we doing all of this? Um, the vision from the very beginning was to be able to use this data to affect change, like I mentioned a minute ago. And so our goal is to not only collect all this data, but then make it available to scholars um, in academia and beyond who really wanna start asking some bigger questions. And I've been lucky enough to work for a company that has invested some funds um, in supporting this work and really helping to promote an agenda of um, really quality engagement um, and the study of engagement and on engagement. And so through that, um, I've been really privileged to work with Jess. Um, and it's been fun to dig into some of these more quantitative approaches through our research fellows program. And um, the, the SDGs really provide a great opportunity to look across data. Um, and like I was mentioning earlier, the, the stakeholders on campus who think about sustainability as a field never seem to talk to the folks on campus who are thinking about community engagement. Um, community engaged practitioners and administrators are oftentimes they're sitting in student affairs um, or they're in academic affairs and the sustainability folks might be out of a research office or um, out of more of a business affairs office or even an, uh, its own division as a sustainability group. And, and so without a, a common language, um, there's really a lot of synergy that gets left on the table. Um, and one of the things we've been working with for our administrators is to help them understand how they can make friends and influence people on campus is to help explain why community engagement is a strategy through which we achieve our institutional mission and goals, like contributing to the sustainable development goals. And so um, with that, I will turn it over to Jessica and she can tell you a little bit about how we've been connecting with the SDGs. Awesome, thank you, Kristen. All right, and this is a reminder too for the for the few folks that are in the audience, you're absolutely welcome to be putting questions in the chat box along the way. And we'll try to save a few minutes at the end too and, 
and answer some of your burning questions. So I am Jessica Gibbons and I work for the Julianne Wrigley Global Features Laboratory at Arizona State University. And this is a new kind of department that's actually based on the national laboratory model that emerged after World War II to advance the US in science and tech. And GFL is actually building on this national lab model in order to bring together this really complex collection of social, cultural, and economic disciplines and the science and tech component in order to advance global solutions for the world's most pressing problems that threaten the future of both people and planet. So from record-breaking wildfires and flooding to our current mass extinction event and unpre unprecedented uh, geopolitical destabilization from climate chaos, GFL is looking to bring together a transdisciplinary framework in order to address these kinds of challenges. So I specifically work on the global partnerships team within GFL, and we partner up with organizations that help us to innovate, replicate, and scale solutions for a thriving future. And so we have partners that include the World Bank, the Interparliamentary Union, and the United Nations. And we really deeply believe in that old adage that if you want to go fast, you go alone, or if you want to go far, you go together. So it made perfect sense for us to strengthen our partnership with Collaboratory and see where we could align the UN Sustainable Development Goals framework with community engagement data. And so with that, that obviously begs the questions of what are the SDGs and also why do they matter? Um, so really briefly, the SDGs or the Sustainable Development Goals is a sustainable development agenda from the United Nations that emerged in 2015 that was unprecedented for a few different reasons. And one of the major ones was that all 193 nation states for the very first time signed on to a global sustainable development agenda, meaning for the first time there's global agreement in what the priorities are and how we want to accomplish them at truly a, a, a global scale. So this is an icon grid that you've likely seen before. So there's these F 17 SDGs that seem to span every single topic that, <laughs> that you can imagine. Um, and really what is so important about this is that it gives common language and a common framework for us to come together, as Kristen mentioned, on topics that, that we might otherwise miss each other on. So for example, you might say female empowerment, I might say gender equality, and either way we're gonna meet at SDG five. And so what I always like to say is that this framework is really a way of accomplishing and looking towards equity and justice for both people and planet. And so that's really important, right? Is that it's both sides of the same coin and realizing that our futures are entangled together so that we need a really holistic way in order to be approaching the, the challenges and the solutions that are facing us. So I think this is a really elegant way to be able to think about how the, the with rhinos and you might think about also what the actual number one issue is which is habitat loss and fragmentation for for rhinos and so if i were to start looking at poaching issues then that would then obviously tie into decent work and economic growth thinking why is there local cooperation oftentimes and then you can't help but look at those issues and then also tie together poverty and gender equality issues so this is just one example in just a few sdgs there's likely even more that that underpin this issue um, and this is just a way of being able to think about how many how many challenges and how many goals blend in just to one just to one issue and so let's see now my video back um and so when you think about why do the sdgs as a framework that's that came out of geneva and, and switzerland and came from the united nations why do they matter to higher education and why do they matter specifically let's say to a university in the desert why, why would they matter to to asu for example and Quite simply, if we're a higher education institution, we deeply believe in providing public value and value to society as well. And so the way ASU thinks about it and a lot of other higher education institutions are also grappling with being able to put their work into buckets. We're thinking about discovery, and research, learning and, and educational components, as well as solutions, networks and engagement. And so um, we're really committed to being able to provide public value and making sure that we have use inspired research is, is what we call it. And just to demonstrate as well, our alignment with the SDGs is we didn't just start doing SDG work in 2015 when the framework emerged, right? It was just a way of being able to communicate and report out. And so in 2020, we were actually ranked number one in the US for impact by Times Higher Ed and number five in the world. 
And so just as a, again, as a way of the SDGs are so useful in being able to basically communicate in a, in a globally agreed way of what's important, why, and then how does our work stack up against it? And so with that, it made a lot of sense for me to look at the collaboratory data and see a really obvious opportunity for alignment. So these are just four of the, the focus areas that collaboratory data gathers. And so um, what I saw here was, was a pretty obvious tie to the SDGs. And, and when I look at the sustainable development goals, there's the, the obvious alignment of education access for underrepresented populations. That's to me, obviously SDG four. And if I go down the line, right, I, I wanna read them for each of you. But you can imagine that each of these focus areas have one or more SDGs that they really tightly correlate to. And so we saw this opportunity that there's this gap that SDGs are really good for reporting out and collaboratory data is no exception to that rule. And that this would be a useful way in order to have higher education that's feeding data into collaboratory anyway, have an added value of being able to also align it with the SDGs. And so what was born was a crosswalk framework, which is what, what I've been working on for the past couple of months and thinking through what can sit in the middle and basically be able to translate between collaboratory and SDG data. And so from there, I needed three different kinds of keyword sets in order to basically align the, those, two, those two goals. And so importantly was, of course, the collaboratory data focus area itself. So I went through and of those, uh, of those focus areas, just manually aligned them with SDGs. On top of that, there was the SDSN keyword list. So that's the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is out of Australia, New Zealand, and Pacific. They have a bunch of different nodes around the world. But they specifically came out with a keyword list that is a rather informal list, but a really useful way in kind of being able to cast a wide net for SDGs and some of the keywords that would fall into them. Um, third would be Times Higher Ed. So they have their own bibliometric query in order to pull different research papers using the SDGs as well. And then as you can imagine, right, each of these keywords is going to have a different strength and have a different trade off with those keywords. And so, as I mentioned with SDSN, they're really general keywords. So they're going to they're going to be rendering the most yeses when we put them against our data, um, which is useful as a as a first filter. But we want to be able to narrow that down. And so that's where Times Higher Ed was super useful. And so the uh, Times Higher Ed data uses a biogram approach, which kind of as it sounds, uses two words instead of just one. Uh, in order to help narrow the scope. But the limitation is that this is really for, has a specific use that's that's meant for capturing research data and research papers. And so none of these is bulletproof because of course there's no keyword list that's going to be bulletproof. So by having some redundancy and having a way of creating some spread in order to, to capture the most meaningful data as possible, uh, had, us a way, had a way for, for creating hopefully a, a, a robust and validated framework. So. If we dive into it, this is what it'll look like, and it's really not important to know <laughs> exactly what the data is. But basically what I did is, is picked out those keywords, matched them against the descriptions, and it gave me just a true false. It gave me a zero, one. And against those three frameworks, I did that three times, and then really simply just added them up. And so then I wanted to assign a basic weighted confidence. And so as you can imagine, there was the, uh, the, the three different sets that I wanted to uh, prioritize based off the kind of data that was inputted and the likelihood that the output was something that we could feel confident in. So for example, uh, we had the SDSN keyword list, which as I mentioned, was the most general one. So we assigned that the lowest score and uh, the lowest priority when adding up those three frameworks. The highest one is the collaboratory data because that's the one where the users and the ones that likely did the activity put in that information and then aligned their work with a focus area. So we wanted to purposefully bias the system towards the collaboratory data because we assume that the people that are, are inputting their own information know it best and wanted to put that kind of at the top of the, the top of the pile. And so from there, I was able to make a really basic heat map and being able to assign a confidence level that falls on the spectrum. And exactly as you would imagine, the dark green means we're more confident. The red means we're not really even going to count that. It's the lowest confidence and it maybe means something, but it would definitely require a human eye in order to, to be able to pick apart. Um, so from there, I think we can we can actually dive into a few findings and just as a, as a last look to this is what the heat map really wound up um, looking like. And so there was a bunch of different cells, gave us a bunch of different colors, which means we could ask a bunch of different questions. And so some of the answers to that questions, those questions you can start picking apart when we see that in total, as, as Kristen had mentioned, that there's about 2,500 entries that are that are in the collaboratory data. This is what a given entry looks like. So there's a whole bunch of different information that people can put in on uh, on the the activity entry. And so for this for these purposes, we we're just looking at the description. 
And so if you start breaking apart, what does that 2,500 activity total look like? What I found really impressive is less than 2%, about 1.5% had no match, meaning none of the three frameworks aligned at all uh, across the descriptions. From there, another 8% fell in that lower lowest category, meaning it was one of the bottom two frameworks that it aligned with one or more of those SDGs. And then from there, 32% had medium confidence. So meaning there was at least one of the, 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 the second most uh, confident framework and maybe the, that top one as well. But something that's really impressive to me is that nearly 60% were at that high and highest confidence, meaning there was alignment with the frameworks that, uh, that we, could, we could really strongly say and prioritize that at least one SDG was aligned in that activity. And so if we wanna look at a different way of, of seeing the data, this is the overall over representation and spread of the SDGs through the 2,500 activities. And so just as a refresher too, right, each activity has the opportunity to align with 17 SDGs. So that's why you'll see these numbers obviously don't add up to that 2,500 and, and that's why. But if we take a look at it and see what's the spread, so without, without reading each SDG to you, but obviously quality education is, is coming up on top, which would kind of make sense being in a, a higher education institution. Uh, and from there, decent work and economic growth, reducing inequality in sustainable cities and communities are coming out as the ones that are popping up the most. And so then we were curious of, um, of being able to untangle which SDGs were not just the ones that were coming up the most, but the ones that were coming up the most with the high or highest amount of confidence. And so from there, what we were able to find was really interesting that SDG three, which is good health and well-being, quality education, reducing inequality and sustainable cities and communities were the ones that had the most higher high confidence SDGs. And so, right, for example, SDG eight, decent work and economic growth, while there was a lot of incidences of it popping up, it wasn't with high and high confidence. So that gives us some interesting questions to ask about the frameworks and maybe even the reporting and the descriptions themselves. And so one more way of being able to look at it is that this is called the wedding cake model for SDGs, which is basically just a way of being able to cluster the, the uh, similar SDGs by group. And so as you can tell, right, there's biosphere, which is really the environmentally sustainability focused uh, SDGs. So there's life on land, life on water, clean water and sanitation and climate action. Uh, society are the, exactly the, the SDGs that you would imagine that are the ones around poverty and energy and education. Uh, and then from there, economy, which is going to be around um, reducing consumption and decent work and economic, economic growth and industry and innovation. So this is just another way of being able to look at that, the SDGs. And so if we go back to that same grid that I had before, so these are the 17 SDGs, and we re rearrange them based off those three sectors. So we have biosphere on the left, society in the middle, and then economy on the right. This is another way of basically being able to look at the the uh, 30,000 foot view spread of where do the SDGs fall. And again, this is kind of what I would assume, right, of having more society based sustainable development goal activity entries, given the, the kind of entries that are going in around community engagement and maybe some lower reporting on the biosphere side. Um, the ones that had the high and highest confidence are are highlighted with the, the yellow arrows and those fall with the society and the economy economy sectors, which I find really interesting as well. Um, so then I think it's really important to ask, what are some of the implications from this data? And what can we do with these frameworks? And what are hopefully some of the future questions that we can start asking? And the really basic assumption that I like to have with this data is that there's no lack of brilliant people doing meaningful work at universities pretty much anywhere in the world. And that um, while that's not the problem, there's a couple challenges that do face the, the meaningful gather, gathering of information. And so what SDGs and Collaboratory does really well is that it provides a way to provide and compare apples to apples, right? So by having that, as I mentioned before, the idea that if there's gender equality and female empowerment, how do we have a way of bringing those together and stacking them up in order to compare? And so by having a way to, to compare apples to apples, you're also able to shore up weak spots, meaning you're able to, to see, is there a lack of reporting happening here or maybe even a lack of work that's happening in that spot? And it lets you have a more rounded approach in, in being able to approach the sustainable development goals, which is really useful enough for multiple practical reasons. And from there, you're right, we've all heard the term of uh, finding the signal through the noise, right? And there's a lot of noise that happens. At, at universities and a lot of data and a lot of information. And 
that addresses one problem of just collecting the data itself. And so Collaboratory does that really well of having a way to not only collect data, but then also the really hard part, in my opinion, is having a way to be able to sort through it and find meaning in that data. So just collecting information isn't sufficient, but having a way to sort through it and be able to pick up patterns and being able to see gaps is absolutely critical. So with Collaboratory and the Sustainable Development Goals, it's kind of a two-in-one punch that lets you see where where are you weak, where are you strong, and are there ways that you can you can kind of shore up those those spots as well. And by discovering these gaps, I mean, the sustainable development goals are, are purposeful in their way of being able to approach both um, both the challenges and the solutions that, that are needed. And so understanding that there's not one weak SDG that's the one that you can leave behind and it's the one that, <laughs> that you don't have to worry about, it's really useful for a university that's interested in public value and, and um, providing value to society uh, and being able to discover your gaps and then also be able to, to double down on your strengths as well. And so with that, if there are questions, we're happy to do some questions, but otherwise we can, uh, we can see what, what's going on in the chat. But otherwise it, okay, there we go. <laughs> and so I think, so that's the, uh, that's the end of my presentation. If there are any questions, we'd be happy to have them. And thank you all for, for joining in too, wherever. If you're just curious about anything with SDGs or higher ed or community engagement, we're welcome. We got a, we got a few minutes left. We're happy to, to chat for a little bit. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. And I think this session will go a little bit past the two and a half minute mark. So if there's additional things, we can hang out for a few minutes more. But um, yeah. Oh, do I see Pooja in the crowd? That's, that's my uh, that's my that's my queen. That's my that's her. Nice. Um, I will say, if you're working in community engagement at your institution and you're needing a, a framework to help faculty who may not feel like their work is community engaged, um, to realize that it is, I think it's very hard these days to find a faculty member whose work does not align in some way with an SDG, which ultimately, to my mind, is community engagement or public service in some form. Um, and so it really provides a useful framework for helping just to have the dialogue and find an entry point. I think a lot of times people go, oh, I'm not community engaged and they shut down. Um, and this is a nice way to get in the door, so to speak, and then um, to also introduce them to the SDGs. I know it's been hard to translate them in, in a context that higher ed can resonate with and figure out how they can make an impact on something global at the local level. Um, but there's a number of groups that are, are working on that right now, like the Times Higher Ed, um, who are making some good progress, so. That's a, I know, it's one of those things, it's not, it's not as hard as it seems aligning with the SDGs, and if you read through them, there's 169 targets, I think, that fall within the, the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, and so if you read them, you're, you're able to align your own work with the SDGs, or if there's a more automated way, you can, uh, you can head over to Collaboratory as well, so. And with that, we'll, I'll leave our, our contact info up and I'm, I'm sure we're, we're both happy to be, you can reach out to us anytime and, and shoot us a message and uh, we're always happy to, happy to chat. Cool. Well, if there's, if there's no questions, I'm okay with, with closing out and we can leave our, our emails up and if people want to reach out, they're absolutely welcome to. Thanks for joining us. Awesome. Thank you guys.